Yes, folks, it's John G. Sutton here, Tales from the Jails. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Wormwood Scrubs today, because tomorrow night at, I think it's 9 o'clock on ITV, there's a documentary about uh, Britain's notorious prisons, and it's all about Wormwood Scrubs. Well, I was at Wormwood Scrubs in 75, 76, and uh, it was pretty rough. I mean, it was a strange place. I mean, it was pretty much like Strange Ways. It was a screw's neck, you know, that didn't take no messing about. And uh, there was a, a gang there, a group of them, that used to uh, play silly games with the inmates. That they, they, To me, it was just an abuse. You know, stupid things like they had a length of rope where they pretend to hang somebody. They never hung anybody. They honestly didn't. I saw them playing this game. And you go and see the scene. I said, listen, uh, this is stupid. You know, it's got to stop. And uh, next thing you know, they'd be, they'd be coming at you with a bloody rope <laughs> saying things like, uh, why don't you mind your own business, you silly bastard? You know, piss off back to Manchester or whatever it is. And uh, so basically it was the same old routine, you know, they, they got themselves out of hand. Eventually, I mean, it will be no doubt, I mean, I don't know, I wasn't involved in the filming of uh, the documentary tomorrow night, but no doubt they'll cover the fact that there was groups of, in, of prisoners who were torturing and abusing inmates and they got uh, prosecuted. Uh, in the 1980s, I believe it was, or maybe the early 90s, they got prosecuted for abusing inmates. When I was there, it was mainly C-Wing and the, and the Block that they had it. On the Block, I've previously told this story, they used to, uh, on, on the hard-boiled eggs, they used to write things like bent copper, child killer, you know, terrorist or whatever. And when you came down for your breakfast, you had to select the egg that matched your crime. And if you didn't, then it got some big bastard who just smashed the thing out of your hand and chase you back to your cell. Or grab hold of you and smash you about a bit. So, tomorrow night, about nine o'clock, documentary about Wormwood Scrubs. Uh, it was built to the design of a man called Sir Edmund Duquesne, who was, at the time, the commissioner for prisons. He was head of all the prisons. And uh, the prisons used to run like clockwork, apparently. You know, seven o'clock, unlock, half past seven, breakfast. You know, this, that, the other. Absolutely, that's how it ran. But, I mean, in them days, uh, Wormwood Scrubs wouldn't have been holding 2,000 inmates. He would probably be holding, what, the, the, holding the number that it was designed for, about 900. And D-Wing at the Scrubs uh, was used as a female prison. Uh, so they, they didn't interact, in, inter, intermix, but the D-Wing was the thing. So if you look at the front of the Scrubs, with the twin towers that the Scrubs, yeah, and the picture of Elizabeth Fry and John Howard, they're prison reformers, they're relief characters uh, images on the on the towers on the left the first wing on the left as you get through the gates that's a wing then b wing c wing and then d wing and i was uh, officer on c2 landing on c wing c wing was uh, quite a horrible place it was used as a local prison but it took all the dregs of society. On, on C1 landing, they had certain cells that were allocated specifically for the paraffin lamps. That's the tramps. Now, anybody who's read my book, HMP Manchester Prison Officer, will have come across the descriptions of what happened to the paraffin lamps. I mean, I'm not sure if they're going to feature that in the documentary tomorrow night on ITV at 9 o'clock. But if, I hope they do, because uh, that was a horrible feature of Sea Wing. Because the police would just bring them off the streets. Magistrates, three months, put them in strange, put them into not strange ways, into the scrubs. And that's where they go straight onto C2, like C1 landing. C1 landing, 
And uh, these people were unwashed, infected with all sorts of problems, creepy crawlies all in their hair. And they used to stick, throw them into the shower unit and get a, a fire hose and hose them down. I, I, as I say, I tell the story in my book. You can get that on Amazon, by the way. And uh, I highly recommend the audio book. It's really good, that. In fact, I've got it on here. Let me play you a little extract from it, yeah. See if I can, see if I can get that here. About the... Uh, about the paraffin lamps on, on C1 landing. When I first went in there, it was uh, the first week I was there. They said, I'll go and clean themselves out. You know, you get the worst jobs. And one of the, one of the jobs I got when I first went there was uh, dealing with the cleaning out the cells because they're doubly incontinent, you see. They don't even bother, you open them, they go to the cell, they don't bother coming out, they just defecate and make make a right mess of it, yeah. So let me see if I can get this up here, yeah. Right, here we are. The ex coal man was there, and we organised a meeting of our group from Strangeways Jail. Everyone seemed in reasonably good spirits, though... We all felt this was a seriously spooky place with its long oak-panelled corridors and shifting shadows. On registration, we'd each been allocated a shared barrack block-style bedroom within the main house and placed into units of 20 other new recruits. The course started the following morning at 9am with a formal parade at the side of the building, somewhat like being back in the army, I thought, as we formed ourselves into three ranks, one behind the other. Our group instructor was a somewhat sanguine principal officer in his late 40s who optimistically enthused about life inside the walls of Her Majesty's prisons. That's it. That's, the, that's part of the book read by an actor called Alan Turton. The voice is uh, about right. It's, it's reasonably deep. It sounds a little bit, but it sounds a, a more of a London accent. Anyway, I'd highly recommend that you watch this uh, documentary tomorrow or put it onto recording and watch it when you're ready. Uh, but they're going to be talking about that. When I was there, they were uh, discussing, because it hadn't been long since he'd been in, a prisoner called Nicholas Van Hoog Straten. Apparently, well, he was a multimillionaire and he was uh, convicted of m uh, murder, but he got out on appeal. Goodness knows how he got out on appeal. But apparently when he'd been in the scrubs, he'd been throwing his money around and uh, bribing everybody. Apparently some of the staff had taken his money and uh, he was considered to be uh, the man. I know one, one of Nicholas Van Hoogstraten's close friends who'd been round Hoogstraten's mansion. You know this crazy mansion he built down near Brighton? Been all around him. Hoogstrat had shown him around. Said uh, he's a dangerous man because he's a slum landlord, you know. Apparently, what he'd done is uh, arranged for some of his hitmen that he, he employed to take a grenade and throw it into one of his enemies' offices and kill them, blow them up. Dangerous man, Nicholas. Well, that's what I heard. I mean, that's that's the rumor I heard. Yeah. It's alleged that he did that, shall we say. Nicholas Van Hoogstraten. It's that time of day and I'm going to do a song here. Are you ready? Yeah, it's the song dinger. And I am going to do a song, but I'm going to do a song and dissect it. I've done this earlier in, in these... So you might have seen it before if you've been assiduously watching my channel. This is me uh, explaining what happens with a song called, recorded by Nat King Cole, by the way, who was a brilliant singer. Nat King Cole in the 1950s, 1960s. This is Walking My Baby Back Home. And I'm going to interject as I go along. Mm. So we'll, we'll, we'll discuss this as we get through it. Because mm. I think it's a very strange song. And people just accept it as being, seriously, they accept this song 
as being, oh, it's a great song, you know, ha, ha. Yeah, but listen to it. Listen to the words. And I'm going to talk about this as I go through it. Here we go. Walking my baby back home. And there's a little... That's the last warning. Larry's out of here now. He's gone. Chasing his favourite goat. Yeah, they're running now. They're running. Go and get them. Larry's after them now. Let him catch him. Big well he's on. Here we go. Walking my baby back home. Gee, it's great after staying out late. Walking my baby back home. Arm in arm over meadow and farm. Walking my baby back home. Now, we'll stop there for a second and just consider what we've heard there. He's established that it's late, yeah. And he's walking his baby back home. We assume that this baby is a young lady, yeah. Uh, colloquialism for a female friend, a young lady, a baby. Call it your baby, yeah. And there he's got arm in arm and he's walking her over Meadow and Farm. What kind of shoes is she wearing? Come on. I mean, if you go walking over Meadow and Farm, you walked over a meadow, they've got great clunks of earth, they've got holes in the ground. Yeah, the sludge mud. I mean, we don't say what kind of weather it is, but if he's going to go over over a meadow, then you can guarantee there's going to be clumps of earth. So he's been out on the town. It's late. He's got around. He got in an arm, and they're walking through the, the. And then they come to a farm. And what do you find on a farm? Come on, there's pig shit, end muck, all sorts of crap all over the place. Yeah. Cobbled floors, yeah, bits of machinery, tractors, trucks, forks and shovels. Usually there's about two big dogs. And he's taking her through this farm, over the moors, through this farm. And she can't be wearing normal shoes, because you try walking over meadow and farm wearing, say, high heels. How far do you think you're going to get? So anyway, that's what I think, a very strange, very strange song. I mean, already you're starting to agree with me here, I can see it. Anyway, let's go on to the next verse there. We go along harmonising a song, or I'm reciting a poem. Owls go by, they give me a cry, walking my baby back home. This guy, he's got his arm round her, they're on the moors, They've been through a farm, now they're singing songs, and, to top it all, when they're not singing, he's reciting poetry to her. It's already late at night, up on the moors, it's pitch bloody black, who knows, might be cloudy, could be rainy, yeah, we don't know. It's terrible weather, yeah, perhaps, we don't know, he's not explaining all that, but he's reciting a poem. What is he saying? I wandered lonely as a cloud, or vale and high that walked on hill, when all at once I saw a crowd, a, a, a farmyard full of pig shit. What kind of a... It's weird, isn't it? Anyway, so you established how strange this is now. Next, next verse, yeah. We stop for a while, she gives me a smile, and snuggles her head on my chest. We started to pet, and that's when I get her tail come all over my vest. He's not even wearing a shirt. This guy's got a vest on, yeah? She's covered in paint or powder or whatever it is, talcum, yeah? And she's giving him a smile, so she's obviously bloody deranged, isn't she? She's in the middle of the moors. She's asking for trouble. Hmm? And then she and they're starting to pet. What does that mean? Ooh, lovey-dovey, boo-boo-boo, in the middle of the moors. Hey, obviously she's not been watching TV lately. Right, okay, next verse. After I kind of straighten my tie, she has to borrow my comb. One kiss then, I continue again, walking my baby back home. He's got his comb out, what's he doing? Combing his hair, in the middle of the moors, been reciting poetry, singing songs, he's covered, got a vest on, it's covered in can, she's combing her hair. Right, they're deranged, aren't they? Next, next verse, see you ready? 
She's afraid of the dark, so I had to park outside of a door with its light. She says if I try to kiss her, she'll cry. I dry her tears through the night. This is strange. In the verse before that, he was in the middle of the moors, combing his hair, covered in muck all over his vest. Now he's in a car, parked it outside. She's threatening to scream, cry, whatever it is. She's been kissing him there. They were pain. She's deranged, and I'm sure he's no better. I mean, it shouldn't have taken her on the moors in the first place, if you ask me. I mean, they're probably both slutched up to buggery. Final verse. Hand in hand to a barbecue stand, right from a doorway we roam. Eats and then it's a pleasure again, walking my baby back home. Loving my baby, I don't mean maybe, walking my baby back home. So there's a special, oh don't forget he's already been out on the town. And now he's taking her to a barbecue stand. Now, I don't know what one of them is. Is it one of these trucks that they push through the street where you get one of them hamburgers and when you eat it, the next day you've got the shits for a week? Yeah, that's it. That's what he's done. I'll tell you what, that's Nat King Cole. If he offers to take you out for a night out, tell him to piss off. Eh? You wants to be stranded in the middle of the moors. That's my little take on walking my baby back home. Don't forget to watch uh, tomorrow night. It's on ITV. Um, Notorious Prisons, Wormwood Scrubs. I was there in 1975, 1976, and it was a horrible place. Paraffin lamps. Don't forget to get my book, folks. We'll meet again. <laughs>